So here we are, episode 23. I was looking at my notes. It's been a whole month since we've been together. That kind of sucks. Except for the few of you that saw me playing around yesterday, making sure everything still works. So I am your host, Dr. Mark Merriweather Vorderbruggen, forager, author, scientist, and dad. Big ego. Big ego. And also joined, of course, is Miniweather. As Hello. usual, doing all the important stuff like answering questions and that sort of thing. So, uh, wow. Um, oh, first off, let us say a huge thank you to Uncommon Bees. They are tonight's uh, sponsor. I highly recommend if you could post the uh, link. You check out their store. I have had a many year relationship with Uncommon Bees. They are my go-to supplier of all thing beeness. Whew, okay. So moving on to, like I said, why you all are here. The Edible and Medicinal Aquatic Plants of Texas, part three. Tonight we will actually be finishing up the freshwater plants. There's a few more we need to talk about. Excuse me. Uh, and then next week we will start the coastal saltwater plants. But moving on, the freshwater edible and medicinal plants of Texas. And you know what? Did I just screw something up here? Ah, okay, good, good. It's been so long, I don't know what I'm doing. But that's never stopped me from doing things in the past. All right, the uh, first of the edible slash medicinal plants is mainly an edible plant and it is called wapato also known as arrowhead also known as uh, duck potato and also known as hopness if you are familiar with the hunger games uh, series of books the uh, female protagonist katniss she was named after the uh, earth version of this particular plant, uh, the, um, the Katniss tuber, <laughs> as opposed to the Wapato or the Hopness. So there's a variety of species of this in Texas. They're pretty easy to spot because they have this very, very distinctive uh, arrowhead-shaped leaf. Let me just move on here a second. So the leaves are heart-shaped. So, you know, shaped like a heart. But if you flip it upside down, I guess it looks more like a heart. They have palmate veins. I tell people, look for the big spider on Wapato. We're not talking a real spider, but if you look at the veins, you will see they all start at the, the base of the heart and run out like the legs of a spider. And then the edge itself is what we call an entire edge. That means there are no teeth, no serrations, uh, the edge is one smooth, uh, you know, continuous line. No teeth, no serrations, an entire edge. It does have that cleft, the lobe, uh, but that does, I guess that's too big to be considered a tooth or a serration. Uh, so that is the leaves. The stem underneath the leaves and also supporting the flowers are smooth, no hairs. Uh, and they are round tapering. They're fairly large at the base, fairly large, like, you know, maybe slightly bigger than my, you know, eh, almost as big as, you know, my finger, and then tapering down to about the size of my pinky uh, towards the top where they join with the leaf. The flowers, and do I have a picture? I, just a minute here. Oops. Ah, yeah. So the flowers are, they usually have three flowers blooming at a time, and then clusters of previous uh, open flowers forming seed pods and then f uh, flower buds, but they will be grouped in threes. So uh, if you have three flower, well, if there are flowers open, there'll be you know three flowers or six flowers or nine flowers, but there will be in groups of three. Yellow, or sorry, white flowers yellow center, including the stamen, the, you know, the, the pointy stuff, the male parts of the flower. Uh, often with red dots, sometimes the three red dots will be fairly small. And then the, the flowers themselves have three petals. There's something about Wapato that really likes the number three, because I guess 
If you remember Schoolhouse Rock, three is a magic number. The flowers are in a whorl around the stalk. So if you have a stalk, you'll have the flowers on the same level, just in a circle around the stalk. Very distinctive. Um, in a bit, we'll also see water plantain, which is in the same family. It has a different shaped leaf, but it has the same triplet flower thing going on. Um, so if all you see are the flowers, it could be the wapato or also the edible water plantain. Hopefully it's the wapato because the wapato is significantly tastier. Now, as far as mimics, there is a dangerous mimic, the arum. Uh, I'm not going to... I don't pronounce Latin very well, so I'm not going to say the scientific names out of fear of you know conjuring a demon. But the arum, the tubers of it, it has tubers that look very similar to the wapato tubers, but the arum tubers are filled with crystals of calcium oxalate, which after a few bites will taste or feel like you are eating fiberglass, uh, which is bad. Your, your whole mouth will have little daggers of calcium oxalate crystals from the toxic arum, the mimic of the wapato, embedded in your, your tongue, your throat, the roof of your mouth, all that. And then these crystals will also cause all sorts of nasty problems throughout your body. So you don't want to mess with the arum. Easy to tell the arum from the wapato though. So the wapato has that palmate vein structure where you have you know a bunch of veins coming out from the very base where the stem connects to the, the leaf, whereas the arum has what's called the pinnate leaf structure. And a pinnate, it has a center vein and then all the other veins come off it. Think of pinnate looking kind of like a Christmas tree where you have the center vein, that's the trunk, and then all the other veins come off that center vein. So hopefully um, that will be you know very obvious if you see these things. Um, where you find it, let's see, it's, oh, okay. So uh, just where you find it, mainly you will find these in very, very slow moving streams or uh, just uh, ponds and still water, but fresh, uh, slow moving streams and fresh, small lakes, still water type things. Let's talk now about what you eat on the Wapato. So in the early part of the summer, so in the spring and early summer, you can eat the leaves and the stem uh, that's coming up. Uh, ideally, you want to get them when the leaves are still kind of rolled up before they, you know, when they first come out of the water, they'll be rolled up like a scroll and then eventually it unrolls into the whole arrowhead or uh, heart shape. So they're best to get them. They'll be tender when they're nice and rolled up and just come out of the water or still just under the surface of the water. Now, like any plant you take from the water, you do want to cook it. The purpose of cooking it is mainly to kill any bad bacteria, protozoas, or other things that would cause like, well, what we called in Boy Scouts, beaver fever, or you know, bad diarrhea. If you get, you know, drink untreated water, you can get all sorts of nasties growing in your stomach uh, that then decide they wanna leave en masse multiple times and it's pretty fierce diarrhea. So you want to make sure you cook the leaves and the stems just to prevent or just to kill any of the bacteria that might be on it, protozoas or other aquatic nasties. The tubers are the best part. Uh, the time to collect the tubers is after the top leaves and stems and all that are dying or dead. So ideally you want to find where the wapato is in the summer and then go back in late fall and start, uh, well, the traditional way is you, you basically strip down to swim trunks and start walking around the, the wapato bed and dig in the muck with your feet and your toes. And when you come across one of these kind of golf ball sized tubers, you yank it off the the root with your toe and let it go and it floats up to the surface and you grab it rinse it off and drop it in a basket on your back or in a, you know, if you have one of these cool bags from from kevin you could put it in there too um but you you basically walk around in the water and feeling for these tubers with your toes rip them off 
let them float to the surface and put them in your bag. This is much nicer to do in Texas because even in October and November, the water is still you know, relatively comfortable as opposed to Minnesota where I grew up. Um, in late November, a lot of the stiller waters is already starting to freeze over, so it's kind of cold collecting those up north. So be glad we're down south where you can get them. Of course, you do have to watch out for alligators and water moccasins. Now, the flowers are not eaten. Uh, you know, spring, summer, just let them go. And then the seeds also are not eaten. But these things do produce quite a few tubers, and that's what you're after. So, any questions at this point? No questions. Wow. Do we have anyone watching yet? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Cool. Sometimes I worry. All right, so that is the Wapato, a really, really good plant. I uh, found it all over basically East Texas, Coastal Texas, uh, Central Texas, uh, Plains, Texas, uh, Northern Texas. It's really just not in West Texas, um, but the rest of the place. Oh, um, you can also grow these really well if you get the tubers. Uh, and you have access to, you know, if you have some land with a stream or a uh, pond, you can plant these tubers and they will grow very readily the next year. Oh. Yep, we have a question. Yeah. How do you cook tubers? Okay, these things are just small potatoes. So you can roast them, you can boil them, then mash them, you can hash brown them, you just treat them exactly like a potato. So peel it and potato it. Easy peasy, easy potato -y. Okay. So, I guess else? that answer is what does the plant taste like? Yeah, so it, it, it pretty much tastes like a potato. Um, starch, you know, cooked starch. Um, I do recommend giving it a good cleaning even before you're peeling it, uh, just to make sure you get any mud and muck and stuff off like that. Uh, oh, uh, if you are really curious about the taste, you can go to an Asian market and a lot of time they will actually have these for sale there in their produce section. Um, I'm not sure what they're called, but if like if you're in the Houston area, if you go to the 99 Ranch, is it 99 Ranch? Is that the big? Yes, 99 Ranch or the other uh, Asia, big Asian markets around Houston, they carry the Wapato. Is there another question? Uh, just, do you know where to get tubers to grow? And I assume that was, you answered that. Anymore. Oh, well, okay. So there are water gardens that sell them. Uh, Nelson's Water Garden sometimes has, has them. You can also order the tubers online from different uh, aquatic nursery type things. I've done that in the past and I've had pretty good success with that. Off the top of my head, I don't have any specific recommendations as to which one, uh, but they are available. The ones from the Asian markets, uh, I've had about a 50% success rate with them. Um, the biggest issue is a lot of times they will trim uh, off the bottom side. If you imagine an onion, so you have like the top where you have you know, the, the, the chives and the onion plant coming from. And at the bottom of the onion, there's a little cluster of roots. Uh, the wapato, it's kind of like that. The tubers at one side, they have the little cluster of roots. And if that's cut off, it drastically reduces, well, 50% uh, reduces the viability of the tuber reproducing. So anything else? Yeah. Okay, wow. All right, so moving far. on. Next up, water hyacinth. This is an interesting and terrible plant. You may have seen this covering waterways. This is actually an invasive uh, plant. And before we go any farther, let me explain uh, that this is wreaking, wrecking, wreaking, wrecking, wreaking havoc. Wreaking, thank you. She's <laughs> wreaking havoc with Texas water, surface water, because it is an invasive, very fast reproducing plant with no known enemies, uh, except hopefully you all here by the end of tonight's presentation. Now, because it is an invasive plant, 
it is illegal to transport this. So if you are going to do anything with the water hyacinth, you need to do it there at the lake or pond or river where you harvested it. It is illegal to transport it because it just takes a little bit of this plant returned into any bit of water and suddenly a month later you have huge mats of these green beautiful but you know deadly to everything else in the water um, flower clusters. A uh, big issue with the water hyacinth is they completely shade over the top of the pond or the, the stream and so the plankton and other small aquatic plants cannot get sunlight so they die so the small fish and insect that eat those aquatic plants die and it just death continues up the food chain so these things are really really terrible um, but they are edible so let's talk about that uh, first uh, identification uh, this picture here this is one that I pulled out of uh, Lake Woodlands up on the north side of, of Houston and set on one of their aquatic floating docks uh, so what it is it is a floating plant it is not attached to the muck at the bottom it, it floats freely through the water it is consists of a central core where the roots come down from that and then it has several uh, branches with big and when I say big I mean you know again uh, like the size of a lime uh, air bladder that keeps it floating and then after the air bladder it opens up into a big leaf um, the stem it's smooth round so that the branches when I'm talking about the stem in this case I'm meaning the connection between the central root core through the bladder to the leaf uh, but it's round and then the stem is where that air bladder is uh, then the flowers are blue to pink very pretty usually they will grow on spikes so in the center of this plant you will have a spike sticking up with these quite large clusters of very very pretty flowers I will say when if you don't know the devastation it is doing to the water um, the water hyacinth is very attractive. In fact, that's why it was first brought over, uh, I believe from Asia is where it was originally from. Uh, it was used as a decorative uh, water plant in people's water gardens uh, over 100 years ago. And then over time, it just escaped into the wild and took over. But the flowers are blue to pink, two to three inches across. So they're, they're, they're pretty big. Um, they're on stalks, so you'll have the center stalk up and then the bunch of the flowers will be in clusters around that. It looks like they have six petals, but technically they have three petals and three identical sepals. The difference between a petal and a sepal is the petal is on top. So if you have a bunch of... Can I get your hands in here? <laughs> okay, so these are four petals. And then if you have another layer underneath those, those are sepals. So petals will be on one, one layer, and then the next anything underneath that are considered to be sepals. And in this case, the three petals and the three sepals look pretty much identical. Striped, usually a darker color, you know, either darker blue or darker pink uh, than the original flower. And a single one of those petals, uh, one single petal will have a yellow dot on it. Uh, very, very distinctive, very, very beautiful, very, very large floating in the water. But again, I cannot uh, just get home how, how damaging these things have been to the Texas waterways. So let's talk about eating these bastards. So the water highest thins, uh, the leaves when young, uh, like the wapato before that, when the leaves are rolled up, uh, is the best time before they've, they've, you know, they're before they've opened up, you know, completely. So when they're still young and rolled, is a good time to get them. Uh, and then also the stem, the young stems, and cook them, steam them, uh, again mainly to kill any bad, uh, you know microbial type stomach invaders you don't want those on there the root is not eaten nor is the core one of the things about the water hyacinth, hyacinth <laughs> i have a hard time with that one 
is that it is a hyper accumulator of uh, really any water soluble compounds in the water. Normally that's not a big issue. The Texas waters are surprisingly clean, but there are areas like out in the Davy Crockett National Forest and you know, say a retention pond off a giant parking lot or something like that, water hyacinth might have gotten into. Um, but if there are poisons of any sort in the water, they will have been taken up into the water hyacinths. Uh, case of pregnant women, I recommend pregnant women do not eat the water hyacinth just to be on the safe side because they are so good at accumulating any sort of toxins. Uh, the flowers before they open, so the flower buds are collected. Uh, if you're familiar with yucca, uh, collecting and using the flower buds, you use those, cook them. I have not pickled them yet because that would involve transporting them, but I'm dying to know if the unopened flower bud would work pickled. But uh, unless I bring all my pickling equipment and pressure cookers and stuff out to a lake, I'm not really going to be able to find out legally. Finally, the seeds are not eaten, but mash them up, you know, burn them, otherwise destroy them. We do not want these things spread. So any questions? No. Nope. No questions. I'm just going to assume I'm a fantastic teacher. Um, many weather. Yep, yeah, I heard that. <laughs> she thinks I'm egotistical. <laughs> yeah, well, I, yeah, I am. Okay. As far as medicinal, uh, the water hyacinth, mainly it is loaded with antioxidants. Now, remember when we talk about antioxidants, uh, the main, oh, okay, we have a question, but let me finish it. When you hear antioxidant, think uh, prevents cancers due to the damage to DNA by free radicals. So free radicals are very reactive compounds that uh, you encounter throughout your your existence and think of them as like axe wielding hobo you know maniacs attacking your DNA uh, chopping it up and when the DNA is damaged it starts giving all sorts of weird signals and if it gives the signals that say reproduce 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 without the associated okay now stop you get cancer so the uh, antioxidants help destroy the free radicals. Like I said, preventing that or greatly reducing the chance of the specific damage DNA caused cancers. All right, and so I thought there was a question. All right, so Mr. Wade Phelps says, obviously we cannot eat all the hyacinth. If I see it in private waters, how do you control it? Nuke it from space, it's the only way to be sure. No, <laughs> old movie quote probably recognize that pull it out of the water and uh what's really you know this this would be a fantastic service project for any boy scouts or girl scouts or or any group looking to really help in fact this could be the next viral challenge the water hyacinth cleanup but you pull all the water hyacinth you hyacinth. can get hyacinth i can't say that word all you can and then seal it up in uh big heavy black contractor garbage bags and then leave it in the sun somewhere. Uh, what happens is those black contractor bags in the sunlight heat up and roast the plants inside, killing them. Um, now this does take several days uh, and the longer, I mean, ideally weeks, and you do wanna flip the bags over and kind of shake them up, but basically they call it solarizing. Another thing you can do if you don't want to use a bunch of black plastic bags, you can lay out the hyacinth on some sort of field or something, a single layer, you know, right next to each other, but don't stack them on top of each other. Single layer and then put a big, you know, the big sheet of landscaping construction black plastic over it. Um, but basically you want to use the sun to destroy it. If you can burn it, you know, burn it, but to burn it, you usually have to wait a while. You know, you pull it up and let it wait. And during that time, there's always a chance something will drag it back into the water. Um, so the best thing I found is either well, black plastic to, to solar burn it to death. Anything else? People think you're a fantastic teacher. Oh, thank you. He is. <laughs> 
All right, so that's the water hyacinth. Ah, someday I'll, I'll learn to speak. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay, it's not Asian, it's native of Brazil. I apologize to Asia. Um, so this is kind of what a big mat of it looks like, and it does block the sunlight. This thing reproduces so fast, it's like the rabbit of the aquatic plant world, except it puts rabbits to shame. Shame. Uh, it can double in population, so the number of plants will double every six days. Now, it still takes a while for the plants to reach full size, so you won't have a full adult plant every six days, but it gets to the point where it can reproduce and produce more seeds um, and cause all sorts of problems. And like I said, it is illegal to transport it. You, you know, If you're pulling it out of the water and throwing it in your car or something and a game warden or a park ranger sees you, you can get a ticket for that, so don't do it. It's it's really, really bad stuff. So, you know, chop it up where you're at. Also, please don't go, wow, that's really pretty. I'm just gonna put it in my little fountain in the backyard because some birds are gonna come along when the seeds are being produced and the birds are gonna eat the seeds and fly off and then poop them in some water somewhere in a sewer, in a, you know, a ditch, something, and boom, the problem has spread. So please just, you know, Destroy it, don't take it home thinking you can control it because in the long run, that's what they thought about kudzu and it doesn't work. And again, just a reminder, it is a hyper, hyper accumulator. So anything bad in the plant will be in the core part uh, to a lesser extent in the stem and the leaves. So like I mentioned again, especially for pregnant women and younger children, probably best not to feed them that. Um, think of this as adult level wild edible plant. All right, any other questions? Not so far. Okay, halfway through. Next up, water plantain. So this is in the same family as the wapato we talked about at the beginning of the show. So it looks very similar to it, uh, but instead of having the heart-shaped leaves, it has a spearhead-shaped leaf, if you will. So let's just look a little closer. Get a little closer. Do, do, do. Oh, wait, I sound like Joe White Biden there. Okay, uh, sorry. Leaves. The le This is probably not the best picture, but it's kind of hard to get the picture of these sometimes. The leaves, like I said, instead of being arrowhead-shaped, they're actually more just like spear shaped. So pointy at the top, spread out, and then kind of come back together at the base. Parallel veins. So uh, kind of like how the uh, Wapato had the pinnate where you know each vein started where the stem was attached. The same with this. At the base of the leaf, each of, it'll just have a bunch of veins running from you know, the, the stem out to the end of the leaf. And like the wapato, it is an entire edge. So no teeth, no serrations. In this case, also no lobes. The stem is smooth, but instead of being round, it is U-shaped with the opening of the U uh, towards the, the top surface of the leaf. So the leaf kind of, uh, I don't know, kind of curves around and then there's a channel that runs down the center front of the stem all the way into the dirt and the muck. And then, oops, yeah, the flower. Uh, going back to cluster, oh, sorry. Uh, in the case of the water plantain, it will still have three petals, uh, but it will be uh, three to four uh, flowers in a whorl around the stem and then a, a fairly large cluster of unopened buds amongst them. But the basic flower structure is still the three petals like the wapato, but in this case uh, they can have three or sometimes four flowers open at the same time. But they are in a circle around the U-shaped stalk, which is kind of funky to do. Uh, but very distinctive. There's really nothing else that has these features. So you don't have to worry about a mimic with the water plantain like you do with the wapato. So eating them, same as like with the uh, wapato. The young leaves, you want to cook them. You know, you know, ideally get them when they're still rolled up like a scroll. 
or just opened. Uh, basically, if they still feel fairly tender, you know, go ahead and harvest them, cook them up, kill any bacteria, microbes, protozoa, uh, and see how they're doing. If, if you're okay with it, um, go with it. The nice thing about this is it will produce new leaves most of the summer. Uh, so, you know, just look at the shorter stems with the smaller leaves and go with those. The stem itself is not eaten. It is quite fibrous uh, for some reason. It's significantly more fibrous than the wapato. The wapato is really isn't much more than almost asparagus-like, but the water planting, it's like eating uh, celery made of twine. So generally not eaten. And cooking doesn't really do anything to help the whole stringiness of the water plantain. The tubers, if you dig those up, and I don't, yeah, I don't have a good picture of the tuber. Um, the tubers are smaller than the uh, water plantains, usually only like the size of a shooter marble, or maybe just a little bit bigger. And even after peeling uh, and cooking, cook them like a potato, roast them, boil them, hash brown them. Um, they're a, a little bit more, well, they're, they, Wapato really doesn't have any bitterness. The water plantain, sometimes it can. Um, if you're hungry, it's not a big deal, but if you're fat and happy, you might find it's like, eh, there are better things out there to eat. So the flowers, Again, going back, the flowers are not eaten, nor are the seeds. Um, I see these a lot in ditches around Houston. So, which leads me to think uh, the seeds are transported by, by, uh, by birds. I don't see the wapato. The wapato usually needs actual permanent water. The water plantain, however, seems to be okay with water that comes and goes, but like all along 2920 from spring to tomball, the ditches are filled with water plantain and uh, really all over the place. If you start just looking around as you're driving places, especially if you see a wet ditch or a ditch that looks like it might have been wet, um, there's a good chance there might be water plantains in them. Any questions? I see Mini Weather frantically responding to people. She is awesome. Okay, uh, medicinal, same as uh, the previous plant in that it is an antioxidant. So like I said, when you see antioxidant, think uh, helps reduce the chance of cancer caused by the damage of DNA from free radicals. It is a diuretic, makes you have to pee. So you want to make sure you drink plenty of water. Uh, as a diuretic, it will help flush out any sort of kidney infection, help with kidney stones. The kidney stones are still going to hurt, but at least you will be peeing and forcing them out. There's been some really interesting research and as why it helps reduce heart disease, it is unknown, but there is uh, a significant, well, okay. Um, I, I won't go as far as say significant, but there's been several studies now that shown uh, that there's something in the water plantain, the leaves and the tubers, that the uh, people that include a lot of it in their diet uh, seem to have reduced amounts of heart disease. So like the, especially the, the hardening of the arteries uh, and the you know clogging of the arteries sort of thing. Like I said, the mechanism by which it's working is not known, and I'm not completely sure that they haven't ruled out other factors that the, might be involved in these people's diets or some other lifestyle thing. Uh, but as far as the water plantain itself, um, yeah, if you're looking to keep your heart healthy, give it a shot. Okay, any questions? Thus far, nope. Um, wow, okay, uh, hopefully, let's see. Well, that's a bummer then, because that was the last of the freshwater plants. <laughs> so we still have, whoops, what's going on here? Don't crash, don't crash, don't crash. Ah, go away, I'm sorry. Uh, I love it when the program you're using suddenly says, hey, there's an update available, you want to use it? 
while you're currently using it. It's like, well, no, I'm using you right now. Give me a chance. Okay, I thought we might run out of time, so I planned accordingly. Uh, if I can find where I set my piece of paper here, because there are some things. Okay. Uh, first off, something to vote on, uh, all you viewers out there. Uh, like I said yesterday, I was just playing around uh, with the software to make sure I remembered how everything worked. And the idea of a secret greeting and handshake came up. And my daughter is cringing right now because she saw kind of what we came up with. Um, but yesterday it was thought that the secret seedling foraging Texas greeting would be forking weeds. Uh, pronounced however you, well, not pronounced, but with whatever emphasis, forking weeds. And then I need my daughter to show the secret handshake, and she absolutely hates this. But you meet, you got the three fingers, and you form a fork, and you go, yeah! So, yeah, three finger, you know, if you see me out in public, and you go, forking weeds, and you give me the three finger handshake. I hope that, it, I, I, it seems okay to me. Um, anyway, vote on that. Let me know you think, yeah, that's cool. No, that's really dorky, or... I never want to be seen in public with you ever. Uh, any of those are good options. So that's the lighthearted part of the evening. Um, but now uh, I want to bring up something a little more serious. Uh, there's been some stuff going on. You know how um, you know people are kind of high strung lately. And behind the scenes, there's been some complaints about foraging instructors. Uh, basically, we are teaching people to destroy the earth. Uh, the complaint is that by teaching people edible plants, they then open up nature to basically being devoured by people, people going out and stripping parks and so forth clean of plants. Uh, this sort of thing has actually been a problem in places like California, uh, from my understanding, some parks in New York and so forth. Um, but there's been a big issue uh, and really some, some hatred towards foraging instructors, uh, basically selling earth for pennies. Um, so if you've been to one of my classes, you know I go a great deal into the rules and ethics of foraging. And really, frankly, uh, here in the state of Texas, uh, legally it is considered illegal to remove plant material from a piece of property without the property owner's permission. And then if you go to the Foraging Texas website, remember on there, you know, the, oops. on every plant, I talk about the abundance. So right under their name and scientific name, I give the abundance and that determines how much of the plant you can harvest. So you wanna keep that in mind. Now, some of these views may be somewhat controversial, but in the end, we want to, you know, protect Texas. We wanna protect Texas nature. We want to harvest in a sustainable manner. We don't want to strip things clean because if the day it gets back to me that foraging is becoming a problem on Texas public lands, all this goes away. Foraging Texas will be shut down because I don't want to be the person responsible for the destruction of Texas nature. So in all my classes and everything, I've put a great deal of trust into you that you will not abuse this knowledge, that you will use this knowledge properly and sustainably and non-destructively. And I've taught thousands of people and it's really one of my worst nightmares is that there are enough bad apples that I've taught that they end up ruining it for all of us. So please, 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 I beg you, forage responsibly. Do not 
be the one that causes all this to go away. Okay? Word on it. Forger's promise. Okay. At this point, um, are there any questions? So far, there are some about like presentations. Okay. So, somebody asked, could you do either like a quick review of previous edible plants, like aquatic plants? I'm not sure you have time for that. Uh, yeah, not really. This Another is the person. third week. Uh, if okay, so on that, if you go back and watch episode 22 and 21 of Meriwether's World here on the Forging Texas uh, Facebook page. Just scroll down to videos and you can see it there along with you know 20 other hours of Texas plants. Okay. Is Star Lily in the presentation at any point? Uh, no, Star Lily is not. Uh, there's a number of really poisonous lilies as, you know, there's day lilies and tiger lilies, which are really edible. And there's things like Lily of the Nile, which can be downright deadly. Uh, so in this case, uh, I did not include uh, star lily. Um, I'm actually, I'm not sure if it is edible or not. Uh, I have never, the fact that I'm not sure, I know I've never come across it in any of my research makes me think that it's not edible. Uh, but I'm always willing to be prove, proven wrong. So I'll try and remember uh, to do some research on that. Anything else? Oh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Aha! Got you. Where do people who do not have private property forage? Good question. Hopefully you have friends, family, co-workers, church members. Um, to the point of my wife is convinced someday I'm going to be shot. Is I'll be driving down the road and see an interesting plant in some farmer's field or ditch or, you know, and I'll go in and knock on the door, you know, and have like a foraging book with pictures of it and say, hey, I saw this plant in there. Do you mind if I take a little bit and, you know, and do stuff with it and, you know, promise to, you know, be respectful of the land and everything. Uh, you'd be surprised, especially when you can teach them and most of you probably have some knowledge now, like you know, some plants around, uh, some of the edible plants in their property, they're very, very, very receptive to the whole idea. So, I mean, it, it, it takes a bit of boldness, uh, maybe a bit of craziness, but you know, there's never, if you ask no, you know, the worst, or if you, you ask a question, the worst the answer can be is no. So, yeah, but it's that sort of thing ask people okay anything else any Bye. news on Meriwether's League of Younger Brothers Everyone's okay so yes 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 I, I have an update <laughs> and that update is so my boss swore that this week she would be sending out a survey to everyone that uh, responded to our request so just a side note so uh, where is it so, like I said, I'm the R&D manager for Workman's Friend. Our first product is Barrier Skin Cream. We've also released our plant-based leather conditioner on Amazon. Uh, I don't have a link for it yet. Um, but uh, we're also coming up with a number of skincare products. One of them is a therapeutic skin cream with a number of great healing herbs in it. And so we wanted to get some real-life testing. So months ago, it's like two months ago, uh, at the request of my boss, I asked people, hey, contact me, contact me, tell me why you need healing skin cream, healing hand cream. It's not just for skin, it can be feet, elbows, nose, ears, you know, but if you have damaged, dried, cracked, pain, bitten, whatever sort of skin, contact me and you will become a member of Meriwether's League of Younger Brothers. The name Meriwether's League of Younger Brothers comes from me experimenting on my younger brother a lot uh, growing up. Is Paul here today, by chance? Not sure. Uh, hopefully, if you're here, hey, Paul, again, <laughs> sorry about your childhood. Um, anyway, so I collected uh, like 39 or 40 some uh, information from people and then gave it to my boss and she said, great, I'll go through this. I'm going to send out a preliminary survey and then follow up with samples of the Workman's Friend uh, Healing Skin Cream, Therapeutic Skin Cream. I don't even know what they call in it right now. Uh, and then after they've used it for two weeks, we'll follow up with uh, another survey. And she's just never gotten around to it. 
Um, like I said, she swore scouts on her, foragers on her, that she will send the preliminary survey out to all of you this week. So, God willing, she will. I keep you know giving her the the eye and saying, well, because it's you know kind of making me look bad too. So yeah, long story short, that's where we are on that. Okay, next question. Does Workman's friend protect from poison ivy? Yeah, I don't know if I actually got to it in regards to the poison ivy, but yes, it does prevent poison ivy from penetrating your skin. The concern, though, is if you get poison ivy on your clothing, the oils, the urshal, and then you are like removing your clothing and the poison ivy oils come in contact with an unprotected part of your skin, you can still get poison ivy that way. So it's great, you know, on your hands, your face, your arms, and so forth, but unless you, you know, basically completely cover your entire body, there is that chance that you'll get a secondary transfer from your clothing. Um, just, you know, something to keep in mind. Whew. Okay, wow, it is great to be back. Thank you very, very much. Uh, like I said, next week, the plan is to start the saltwater and coastal edible and medicinal plants. So until then, good night, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye.